Kobe Bryant and Adidas were done. Kobe had bumped heads with the brand and was not happy with the direction Adidas was taking his signature line. Was the toaster oven shoe the last straw? Maybe. In our last video on Kobe sneakers, we covered his free agency years where he flirted with other brands that were sending him free products at the time. Reebok, Nike, Converse, and even And One would send him stuff. But it would be the swoosh that would sign him where we all know Kobe belongs. Longtime Nike designer Eric Avar would start to design for the Kobe one, but it was designer Ken Link that would finish the final product. Ken had already worked on designing shoes for LeBron James at that point, and the two sneaker greats would come together to make the Kobe one, a very good transition shoe from the Hirachi 2K4 and the 2K5, two of Kobe's go-to shoes during his sneaker free agency year. The Kobe one featured a leather and suede build with a carbon fiber shank plate and two zoom airbags in the sole. The design tried to connect some of that Hirachi influence with the cutout on the Achilles designed to give the wearer more flexibility in the foot. Although the Kobe one isn't one of the most notable models in Kobe's lineup, the shoe would be known for being the choice of footwear for arguably one of the most unbelievable games in NBA history. On January 22nd, 2006, Kobe Bryant would drop 81 points on the Toronto Raptors. He went 28 for 46 on shooting, 18 of 20 at the free throw line, and had the second most points in history in an NBA game. A performance that, to this day, still stands the test of time. From the line, and an 81 point game, 55 in the second half. And listen to this crowd for number eight, Kobe Bryant. Kobe wore a white and purple pair with the black swoosh now dubbed the 81 points. The Kobe one would have a handful of original colorways, but in 2018, the Kobe one would get a breath of fresh air with the Proto, a performance retro. The shoe looks identical to the original, but now features a full length zoom air unit. The Kobe two came out in 2006. This sneaker took inspiration from the very popular free technology that was featured on a lot of Nike running shoes at the time. It also came equipped with a podular outsole design, engineered to flex with the foot as it steps. The midsole was kind of awkwardly stitched to the upper, similar to how shoes like the Dunk and the Air Force One are constructed, but this one was done a bit more abruptly. The Kobe 2 was released in a variety of iterations actually. Dubbed the Strength or ST, the shoe would feature a new midfoot strap design for increased stability, which helped Kobe on the court. With the past two models being designed predominantly by Ken Link, Eric Avar would finally step in and work on the Kobe 3, a polarizing sneaker to say the least. Looking back, an outlier of the early Kobe models for sure. The Kobe 3 would consist of a mainly mesh build, designed for breathability with a polyurethane netting or webbing on the upper for structure. A non-signature shoe Kobe was obsessed with was the original Nike Hyperdunk. This shoe gave us great insight on what we would see in Kobe's sneaker models to come. Kobe loved the Hyperdunk. Even wearing it during the 2008 Beijing Olympics when the US men's basketball team took gold. Fun fact, Kobe actually jumped over an Ashton Martin while wearing some hyperdunks. I gotta know, when you guys saw this, did you think it was fake or real? Let me know in the comments down below. Also, if you're enjoying this video, hit us with a gracious like. Thank you. Obviously, this sneaker informed the design for the Kobe 4 greatly. Like the Hyperdunk, the Kobe 4 featured a flywire upper and a zoom air cushion midsole, a match made in heaven for hoopers. From a gold medal in the Hyperdunk, to a championship in the Kobe 4. The 4 would bring something else to the table besides the materials. It has legacy built right into it. And that's what makes this sneaker special. Inspired by his love of soccer, Kobe noticed how players made quick lateral movements on the field 
wearing low top cleats. Nowadays, low tops are a common appearance on the court, but it started going mainstream within the basketball market with the Kobe 4. The 5 was pretty similar to the 4 in terms of technology, but it was made lighter and lower, going full synthetic on the upper. However, the Kobe 4 is a sneaker that had the best colorways in my opinion. The Chaos, the Bruce Lees, the Ashton Martins, and the Dark Knights are some of my personal favorites. Nowadays, NBA players are getting crazy Kobe 4 PEs. DeMar DeRozan and PJ Tucker would both have some PEs made for them and even have some of their own releases of this sneaker. On a super random side note, does anybody remember the puppet commercials that Nike did with LeBron and Kobe during that time? My three championship rings. Kobe, I'm busy. And they represent the three championships that I myself have won. This, this is my problem? Now somewhere in this area, I seem to have misplaced my three championship Kobe, rings. To play a game. Have you seen Kobe? them? I did say there were three of them, didn't I? I don't have time you for this. You probably don't even know what they look like. See, for each one of these delicious Get chocolate chip cookies, there is an equally delicious NBA championship ring that you don't have. Kobe, I'm trying to- One for each chocolatey cookie. M move the cookies up. You gotta be hungry, LeBron. I'm talking about stomach growling. Well, Dog, maybe you should cookies. check your championship ring display case. Oh, snap. Will you look at that? They're my three championship rings. Hello, gorgeous. Oh, you hey, got beautiful. names for them all? What's up, you got Zach? names? That's Y'all playing hide and seek with me. Why do we live together? Such a weird era, right? Anyways, back to the sneakers. When you think of Jordans, the 11 and the 1 usually come to mind first. But when I think of Kobe's, my mind instantly goes to the Kobe 6. Synthetic uppers inspired by snakeskin, a direct tribute to Kobe's nickname, Black Mamba. However, the upper wasn't just for looks. In a process called Kurim, Nike was able to strategically inject polyurethane along the upper in high wear and tear areas where more support was needed. An idea that was also used on the Kobe 3 mentioned earlier. Let's talk about colorways, and it's no secret that Kobe 6 has the best colorways of all the Kobe models and it's not even close. Obviously, the Grinches are number one, but the Chaos colorway would return on the 6, which was pretty dope. There was a pair inspired by Orange County that had these really cool red and orange hues. The Kobe 6 All-Stars, the k -Yows. there was the Kobe 6 China, and then one of the coolest colorways was the Kobe 6 3D, which was inspired by those old Hollywood 3D effects and even came with a pair of gimmicky 3D glasses. I don't know why, but 3D movies always felt like a scam to me whenever I had those glasses on. I could never get into it. I prefer to watch a movie without the glasses. Moving on to the Kobe 7. This sneaker featured a familiar looking upper in terms of construction. It was a synthetic upper made of plastic with fly wire underneath for some structure. It was similar to the Kobe 2 in how there were different models for different play styles. The 7 came equipped with the newly added Kobe system. And there was two different booty constructions connected to two different drop-in midsole options. Attack Strong would feature an ankle strap connected to a full cushlon sole for people who needed just a bit more cushion. Attack Fast was a little more traditional and a lot of what we've already seen in the Kobe line, which featured a lower cut tongue and zoom cushioning. All right, the seven kept up with the six in terms of great colorways, but the six was still the best. There was the Cheetahs, the Year of the Dragon, the Galaxies, and the What Does. There was also the Barcelonas, which all these colorways are amazing. Nike basketball sneakers were on a different level in the early 2010s. The 7 would also debut a new concept for Nike basketball at the time, the Elite Series. The Elite Series was made to give an upgrade to the shoe just in time for the playoffs. The Kobe 7 Elite would add carbon fiber and bring back the Kurum skills along the upper. The Kobe 8 switched things up a bit from a material standpoint. Ditching Nike Flywire and plastics, the Kobe 8 would feature an engineered mesh upper for peak flexibility and breathability. And no more zoom either. This shoe would feature a full Lunar Lawn drop-in midsole. The 8s would also get an elite version for the playoffs, bringing back Flywire into the shoe and zoom air cushioning. Once again, colorways really made this shoe. The Easters, the 2012 Christmas pair, Pit Vipers, the Mamba Curials, and the Black History Months. All amazing colorways. Leading up to the Kobe 9, Nike would bring back the Kobe 1 through 8 in the Prelude Pack, a tribute to the past eight Kobe silhouettes in which each model is inspired by art pieces inspired by different stories in Kobe's playing career. Sneakers inspired by art pieces inspired by Kobe's career up until that point. Confused? Don't be. We're gonna break it all down right now. 
it's pretty cool with this prelude pack that we're doing is to, to be able to look at the shoes and the inspiration that originally was there and we kind of put some of the historical context to it you know, through 81 point game through the misery shoe what's the common denominator that kind of weaves through all of these things right being creative with purpose you know that's what it's all about the one was inspired by his surreal 81 point game and the two was inspired by Marble and how he carved his name into basketball history. The three take the feeling of losing to the Celtics in the finals. As for the four, it was inspired by the unrestrained performance of a champion, featuring splatters like how Kobe was splattered all over the court during that season. The five was bold, like claiming a fifth NBA title. The six took inspiration from Los Angeles and Kobe's heart for the City of Angels. The seven was inspired by Kobe fighting for gold during the Olympics. And finally, the eight was a reflection inspired by how Kobe had to reflect on how he was going to return to the court following his major Achilles injury. All of this leading up to the highly anticipated release of the Kobe 9. This is where the Kobe line would go back to pushing boundaries. Flyknit was used for the first time on a basketball shoe instead of engineered mesh to give more strength and structure, which the eight really lacked. Zoom Air would also be absent on this entry, just a full length Lunulon drop in midsole. Putting Flyknit on a basketball shoe was definitely a step forward for the brand, but more notably was the shoe's height. Although not connected, the dramatic switch came after an Achilles injury while Kobe was wearing the eight. There's actually a design element inspired by this major Achilles surgery that Kobe had with the stitches on the back of the shoe running down his Achilles. The Kobe 9 was meant to be an extension of the foot, like how boxing boots provided support without getting in the way of any movements. The 10 honestly didn't do much at all in terms of technology innovation, although it did bring back Zoom Air in the heel. And the colorways were pretty bad, but the 11 is where it gets really good. The 11 debuted during Kobe's final season in the NBA, a sneaker that marks the end of one of the most decorated basketball players of all time. The 11 was more traditional to what we've seen before in the Kobe line. A low top this time around featuring Flyknit along the upper with a drop in midsole like we saw in the seven through nine and a generous Zoom Air bag in the heel. If you haven't already, you should definitely rewatch the last couple of minutes of Kobe's last game where he's wearing those shoes. You might get goosebumps. On the court, Kobe was obviously one of the best to ever do it and that mentality was kept over to the sneakers. Kobe was actively involved in his line and that's why his line with Nike is one of the greatest of all time. Even after Kobe's playing career was over, he worked with Nike to continue raising the bar for basketball shoes. The Kobe AD line kept the designs going, but none of them really took off like the original line did in terms of the culture. And since his tragic passing in 2020, many NBA players and casual hoopers from all over the world wear Kobe's to pay respect to his greatness. The likes of Julius Randle, Devin Booker, and DeMar Rosen are all players who wear Kobe's every single game. The Kobe 6 is pretty much like the official shoe of the NBA right now. And prices for Kobe's have skyrocketed. Allegedly, a disagreement between Vanessa Bryant and Nike about Nike's failure to get Kobe sneakers into the hands of everyone who wants a pair led to the end of their partnership. As of right now, it's crazy to think that the few Kobe's we got in proto form recently are potentially the last Kobe shoes to ever release. Of course, this could all change tomorrow and Mamba and Nike could reunite in a big way. And that's what I suspect will happen and I'm hopeful for that to happen, but I don't know, what do you guys think? Well, that is the last installment of our Kobe sneaker legacy series and I hope you've enjoyed it. If you haven't seen part one and part two where we cover his uh, Adidas days and his time when he was a free agent and all these brands were sending him sneakers, um, I'm gonna go ahead and put a link of it here or here and uh, go ahead and click on that and I will see you over in those videos. But before you click on that, I just wanna say thanks and consider subscribing to the channel. It would really help us out. It, that, that would support us um, greatly. So subscribe if you haven't already. Here's the link to that playlist and I uh, hope you guys enjoy it. Thank you guys so much. Catch you guys next week. Peace.